This video covers events from Stronghold 1 and 3, intending to give players an overview of characters and stories from the Stronghold series. Spoilers ahead. A time of steel, flame, war and blood. Medieval England finds itself in the turmoil of invasion. Lords and ladies across the realm vie for every piece of land they can, whether for the good of the country or the depths of their pockets. Welcome back to the Lore of Stronghold, where we learn about the history and the stories of the series through the characters and battles which populate it. With this chapter, we will be finishing up Series 1 with the story of Duke Volp, otherwise known as the Wolf. A mysterious warrior lord who descended upon England with both ambition and bloodlust in equal measure. Soon you will see what it means to wage real warfare. Greetings, sire. Your stronghold awaits you. Wood needed, my lord. Duke Volp recognised the power of knowledge. As such, details of his family's lands or accounts of his kin are scarce, shrouded in a carefully maintained veil over his past. He was cautious of anyone that might want to study his strategies or culture. This, as we have seen in previous episodes, was in stark contrast to Duke Beauregard or Duke de Puce. But one thing we do know for certain is that both his parents died in quick succession shortly after his 18th birthday, leaving him as head of the Volp bloodline. For further clues about his personality, one need only look at his costume, for it betrays his guardedness. As ironclad as his intentions and desires, his armour covers him from head to toe. His salad, pauldrons and cuirass are edged, sharp and pointed. Volp announces himself with the heavy clattering of steel and mail, a battering ram of a man who has little time for compassion or mercy. During the King of England's foray into the barbarian lands, he was captured, leaving the country ripe for the taking. It is unknown who first decided to take advantage of the ensuing chaos, but by the mid-11th century, when towns were being burnt, peasants murdered and resources divided, there was one man acting as spearhead to the operation, Duke Volp. It did not take long for the moniker of the Wolf to become commonplace, as he commanded his fellow dukes, dispatched uprising English lords, and sought to make England a compliant underling of his homeland of France. Both serfs and soldiers alike were quick to adopt this new terrifying alias, as no one truly believed that this warlord, so malicious and cruel in his work, could have the heart of a man. He found his new home in Scotland, shackling the local peasants and garrisoning every captured keep and castle he found. An unwavering force of blood-drunk warriors had been unleashed, treating every act of defiance as a personal affront. This new domain was now under his control, but although ravaged, it was ready for revenge. With England under their now plump thumbs, the Dukes maintained a stranglehold on its counties. Duke de Puce controlled the south, Duke Beauregard the west, Duke Truth the east, and Duke Volp the north. But to obtain absolute control of this still unyielding island, a few select English nobles would have to be dealt with. A meeting was called in which the Dukes would parley with the most prominent nobles of England in search of a peace treaty. But, as we have learned in previous chapters, it was Duke Beauregard who orchestrated the ambush which followed, resulting in the cold and calculated murder of several prominent English leaders, including the boy's father. It would be this sole act of savagery which would be the wolf's damnation. 
spurred by the death of his noble father, a young warrior known as the boy would organize a rebellion. This would ultimately be the undoing of the wolf and his plans of domination. The boy's southern rebellion would cut through the occupied south, east and west, killing or maiming any who stood in his way, including the wolf's fellow dukes. Seeing that his allies were falling, being overrun, besieged and beheaded at the hands of the boy, Sir Longarm and Lord Woolsack, the wolf was quick to intervene, eager to regain control. First, he would send for the pig, his right-hand man and the most brutal of the dukes, commanding him to aid the rat and the snake in defending their lands from the troops of Longarm and Woolsack. They would claim momentary victories, but despite this, would eventually succumb to England's righteous wave of siege warfare. The wolf began to panic. Perhaps if he had not ruled so barbarously, perhaps if he had not allied with such pig-headed leaders, perhaps if he had not indulged his own wickedness, he would still have England under his control. But with the boy now at his doorstep, he resorted to emotional taunts to try and gain the upper hand. Duke Beauregard may have led your father into the trap, but I drove the sword through his stomach. <laughs> if you still have a hunger for vengeance, you know where to find me. These did not perturb the boy, and neither did the wolf's defenses. For the boy now had the complete and faithful backing of both the king and the royal army. They battled through bloody skirmishes and terrible sieges, reaching the wolf's final stronghold. The wolf used every trick in the book. Stout towers, deep moats, terrible weaponry and powerful siege engines. But it would all be for naught. The boy climbed the stone steps of the wolf's keep, intent on bloody revenge. <laughs> to this day, we know nothing of how the wolf escaped his reckoning, but he did. Some say it was through pure determination and perseverance. Others claim he was driven by unbridled rage due to the humiliation at the hands of this young upstart. Whatever the case, beaten and broke, he escaped to the east. Most assume he travelled to Tiberias, based on his time there during the Crusades. He called on his ally, the Jackal, to assemble the best doctors and physicians from all over the Holy Land to heal his wounds. Despite their commendable efforts, he would forever remain scarred and weathered from his encounters with the boy. The wolf was known to mutter to himself about how he would have been a fair king to England during his recovery, a stern but just ruler. However, having regained the strength in his arms to wield his sword once more, his thoughts turned to retribution. He recruited the jackal, a malevolent eastern warlord, then headed to France to call on the sons of his old allies. Once more, the wolf descended on England bringing with him the sons of the pig, Bishop Redham and Earl Swinefoot, the sons of the rat, Rupert Silverback, Greytail and Roger Scabcoat, and his eastern ally, the jackal. Many of these have their own exploits and downfalls, as covered in our previous chapters. But once more, despite the wolf's new tactics and strategies, the boy was to prove a worthy adversary. He rescued Lord Blackstaff, liberated the Sultan, and aided the Iron Duke. He repelled the wolf's attempts to put a stranglehold on England's famous rangers, vast trade networks, and weapon manufacturing capabilities. With every battle, skirmish, and siege failing, the wolf and his generals started scrambling. Eventually, the wolf found himself fighting alone. The jackal had fled from England, cursing the wolf's name. The rat's offspring had also departed, that they were not foolish enough to disrespect their master. Earl Swinefoot and Bishop Redham were captured after their attempts to imprison Lady Catherine. 
Seeing the second invasion fall around him, the wolf had one final play. He captured the boy's old castle, perhaps a move intended to hurt his pride. He installed a decoy, a loyal commander who was to defend this fortress from the inevitable incoming assault. Who knows what this commander thought when he saw the wolf extract his most capable soldiers, his most ferocious siege engines, and himself. Leaving this panicking commander to fight for his life with nothing more than a skeleton army. The boy arrived and saw both a surprising lack of archers on the wall and a confusing lack of panic from the parapets. But no matter, the siege had already begun. It was a swift victory. And the walls were broken, archers slain, and the duped commander killed. But for the wolf, this was all according to plan. Bob waited for the now dreary, tired forces of the boy to enter the castle. Watching from afar, once the boy was nestled inside, barely protected by the walls he had just besieged, the wolf attacked with a force full of fury and anger, hell-bent on finally ridding England of its most valiant defender. The boy held firm, repelling this latest attack, but doubts plagued his mind. Was this too easy? Had the wolf fled too promptly? The boy gave chase, with fantasies of finally killing the man responsible for England's an ending plague of war. Finding the wolf's fleeing boat down river, the boy saw an opportunity. A small stone bridge laid over the river, and as the vessel sailed underneath, the boy jumped from this bridge and leapt for the boat, bringing his sword down onto the wolf. As the man in the boat looked up, the boy saw not the wolf, but a stranger. And just as suddenly as his heart sank, a net fell atop him. The wolf had given up his brutality and bullheadedness. He now understood the value of deceit, perhaps learning from his old friend Duke Beauregard, a truly terrifying foe who combined the arts of war from his old dead allies. England may have been free, but the boy was not, and the wolf had finally won. It gives me great pleasure to announce, you're finished! And so, this brings us to the end of the first series of The Law of Stronghold. If you have not seen our previous chapters on the rat, the snake, or the pig, make sure you head down to the description below and find links to all those videos. Also, please leave a comment for a particular character, story, or subject you'd like us to cover in a future entry, and we'll do our best to accommodate it. Finally, if you like this video and would like to see more, please hit the subscribe button with notifications turned on to be the first to see future chapters in the Law of Stronghold.